Well, hello, uh, welcome, good evening. Uh, my name is Drew Desker, I'm the director of Copernic Observatory. I want to welcome those of you uh, that made it up the hill the, this rainy evening. I also want to welcome those watching on the live stream. And if you're on the live stream, um, in the chat, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, that's always a, a fun thing uh, fun thing to find out, and we'll share that uh, as we go on. And then finally, also in the chat, uh, as you have questions, uh, you know, for, about the presentation, feel free to put those uh, pre uh, those questions in the chat, and then in the Q and A section, we will uh, we will uh, convey them to our speaker. Anyway, it's uh, great to see uh, a bunch of new faces here. Uh, I think a lot of people from uh, Binghamton University. Raise your hand. All right, super. A couple of uh, familiar faces as well. Uh, and actually, we're going to have to. Uh, it's my uh, duty uh, as host here to make sure everybody gets on the internet. So um, everybody, wave. Hi. There we go. <laughs> oh, we don't. Actually, we're a little. There we go. We get everybody on here. All right. Well, anyway, here we go. So um, who's here for the first time? A couple of people. All right. Well, um, again, we've been around for almost 50 years. Um, we are an informal STEM education uh, facility. Uh, we are a public observatory. Uh, but we really we focus on lifelong learning. Uh, we offer programs for kids as young as three years old with our Copernic Kids program. Uh, today we had a, a program called Girl Power where we were trying to uh, engage more uh, female, uh, more women in STEM. And so, in fact, actually one of our uh, rocket engineers was here. Uh, you were here earlier today, right? Yeah, it's, they were building rockets, and uh, uh, unfortunately, they didn't get to launch them today, but they'll be coming back. It, but they had also had an opportunity to talk to uh, a, a, a rocket engineer who actually, uh, she works at the Kennedy Space Flight Center, and so she talked about the work that she does and some of the education, a little bit about her background, and then the girls get to ask her questions. And um, uh, a few years ago, we actually had a, a, a girl power uh, program where the girls were learning about uh, uh, carbon dioxide levels and global warming. And so they actually were able to talk to an astrophysicist at NASA through one of our, you know, uh, through a Zoom connection. And then at the, at the end of her, uh, at the end of her uh, presentation, the girls get, again, get to ask her questions. And one of the girls asked, how did you get interested in astrophysics? Now these are again, third through eighth grade girls. And I loved her answer. She said, when I was in college, I was an English major. But my boyfriend was a physics major, and we would go from observatory to observatory. I eventually dumped the boyfriend, but I kept the astronomy. She now has her PhD in astrophysics and works at NASA. So you never know where a seed's going to get planted. So who knows, maybe in 15 years, you can do a, a Zoom with us on uh, what, what kind of work you do. Would that be good? Think about it. All right. Well, anyway. Um, uh, Every Friday night from March to mid-December, we always do these, these kinds of programs. It's an opportunity to, to learn about uh, the world. It's not always about astronomy, although tonight actually happens to be uh, about a sort of an astronomical topic. But um, next week, uh, we actually have a meteorologist from the National Weather Service uh, uh, office in Binghamton. He's going to come up here, and he's going to talk about, uh, for those of you that lived in the area here back uh, in 2020, there was... In mid-December, there was a snowstorm that dumped like 40 inches of snow on us here. But yet, if you went like 40 miles to the east or 40 miles to the west, they got like maybe you know eight to 10 inches. So anyway, he's going to talk about that particular storm. How did how, you know what conditions caused all that snow to just drop drop on us? And he's also going to give us a little uh, forecast of what this winter might uh, might you know might look like. Um, and then also uh, the following weekend, or the following Friday, is uh, black is uh, the, the day after Thanksgiving, and we always do a program called Black Holes on Black Friday. So um, again, you're always welcome to come up here for that. But uh, it, if you're unable to be here in person, again, we always uh, live stream stuff. And I'm going to switch over to our live stream. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that um, now we are approaching uh, almost 13,000 subscribers. Um, so every Friday night that we, we can, almost every one of our Friday night programs we can put on our live stream. 
But beyond even the even the uh, our Friday night programs, we have other things uh, uh, where we might do an observing session. So actually, this past Tuesday morning, did anybody happen to see the eclipse, the lunar eclipse? Anybody go out? A couple of people. Um, so Jeremy, our live stream uh, astronomer uh, back here, uh, put a camera on one of our scopes and uh, and actually covered the the eclipse. That's you started at 1:30 in the morning. Uh, the eclipse itself started around three, uh, and uh, continued until uh, we sort of lost it. It was actually in totality as dawn came up and and the moon set. But uh, we had about twenty five hundred people or so on on that uh, on that stream. We actually had more people on our stream that were then were on the Lowell Observatory or the Griffiths Observatory. Back in uh, in May of last of this past year, there was a, another lunar eclipse. Uh, and we had 25,000 people on it. So uh, uh, some, some great opportunities to um, um, learn on our Friday night programs, but also we'll, we'll do some uh, uh, observing sessions. We have a, uh, uh, it's not the opposition to Mars, it's the uh, lunar, occultation. lunar occultation. So the, the, uh, we're Mar the moon is actually going to come in front of, of Mars at one of its closest points to the Earth. So uh, it'll be within a couple of days of, of being its, at opposition. So um, uh, look for that on our, on our YouTube channel. And if you subscribe, then uh, you'll, uh, you'll get uh, updates as to when we go live. So tonight, we are going to have an opportunity to um, learn about a big rock pile that just uh, is just a little bit outside of uh, uh, <coughs> Mars's orbit. Uh, Robert Seegers is one of the educators here at uh, at Copernic and um, is an aficionado, aficionado of uh, of, uh, of asteroids and and uh, things in space. And so uh, at this point, we're just going to turn it over to Robert and uh, let you do your thing. with the solar the area most of them on the Neptune all the new dwarf planets that we're finding out there beyond Pluto it's I think it's really exciting and um, but this is actually we'll, we'll actually talk about a dwarf planet here but it's a lot closer to to us than Pluto and friends so um so um just kind of thought this would be a kind of a fun topic to kind of just get a little overview on. And we're going to go ahead and start our tour. So, so basically, um, the, the asteroid belt was kind of discovered um, sort of accidentally in the early 19th century. And it was because a number of astronomers, even going back to Kepler's time, were convinced there, was a, there should be another planet between between Mars and Jupiter. And uh, they, they basically dedicated themselves to finding it. In fact, in 1800, a group of astronomers in Germany started the Celestial Police, which their, their main focus was to find whatever planets could be between, um, you know, the, probably the planet between um, Mars and Jupiter. So some of these begin to pop up right around then, and we'll, we'll certainly explore them here momentarily. So the mathematics behind uh, the, the reason why they were sure there was something, something uh, between, between Mars, Mars and Jupiter was uh, they came up with this little formula here. And the, the distances between uh, the objects like Mercury and um, Venus and Earth, they were all basically assigned a bit of And using astronomical units, they predicted that um, at about 2.8, there should be um, a planet. So it turned out these planets uh, were the asteroid belt. We call it the main asteroid belt because there are other asteroid belts um, in the solar system. Jupiter, for example, has the Trojan asteroids, which are shared Jupiter's orbit, orbit around the sun. 
and um, basically uh, the kind of trail and, and lead. And there's also um, uh, the asteroids even like obviously between the Earth you know, and the Sun too. We call those near-Earth asteroids. And, um, but this is, this is the main uh, asteroid belt. And here again, we go back to um, um, the tidiest boat um, law where they expected to find planets. And it's amazing all the way through Uranus that it's pretty much right on. So that's, that's pretty amazing. When you get to Neptune, though, it's way off. So Neptune's a lot closer than they should be according to this, this theory. And Pluto, if Pluto were considered a regular planet, um, would have um, also been much farther out. So, so it turns out the first one that was, dis was discovered is also the largest, and it's called Ceres. And it actually was, it was a, discovered by uh, Giuseppe Piazzi in 1801. And we're going to take a very close look at Ceres here later on. But when you look at how far Ceres is from the sun, it's at 2.8 astronomical units, which is what that tidiest bold law predicted. So could Ceres be a planet? Could it be maybe remnants of a planet or maybe a planet that never formed? So, so we can see other, other, you know, other characteristics about Ceres. Um, its orbital inclination means how it's how it's tipped to the plane. It's about 10.6 degrees. Uh, it's almost circular, 0 0.08 for its eccentricity, and it takes about 4.6 years to go around the sun. Its diameter is about, as you see, 587 miles or so, and it takes about nine hours to rotate. It's called a C type of asteroid, and now this is a whole other topic, and we are definitely not going to get into this today. But there's three main types of asteroids, um, and C is called carbonaceous, and those are the ones that are like clay and so forth. And um, then there's the um, uh, S type, which are the silicate ones, which are um, basically are stony. We call them the stony ones, and they actually have some nickel and iron in them as well. And then the M type, which are the metal ones, which we'll visit one here at the end of the program. Um, but if you like look it up, we'll say Ceres is a G type asteroid. I'm like, it's a whole nother like subtopic. So we'll keep it keep it simpler because I have, you know, I got to do a lot of reading on this. Um, anyway, so off to our next one. Um, so the, the next one is discovered is Pallas and in 1802, and it's discovered by Hein. Heinrich Olbers, he was part of the Celestial Police. <laughs> and also he discovered Vesta in 1807. And Vesta and Pallas are like the second and third largest asteroids. So here's the best image we have of Pallas today. Um, it was from the European Southern Observatory in, in northern Chile. This was about 2017. And Pallas is, has a very tipped orbit, as you can see. It's like a, um, like a 30 some odd. We'll see that here in a moment. All right, and you can see, yeah, 34.4. And um, it's a little less circular, but still pretty much. It takes about 4.61 years to, uh, to orbit. It takes about 7.81 um, hours to rotate. And it's pretty big, diameter is 319 miles. So Carl Ludwig Harding that discovers Juno in 1804. So my, we, I should take a time out here. My daughter and I saw Hamilton over the weekend in Rochester. So my daughter saw all these pictures, reminded her of the Hamilton <laughs> character. So that's why we've kind of infused, the, infused some of these. But anyway. Um, so you can see, same type of thing, orbital inclination, 0 0.2, eccentricity, um, close to circular, 0 0.26, 4.36 uh, years to orbit, and 7.21 hours to rotate, and a little bit smaller here, uh, 158 miles, and this is an S type, the stony type that I had mentioned before. Um, Juno, even though it was the third one discovered, is actually quite a bit small. It's only the 10th largest one, but it must have been in the right place at the right time, and it's also, I think, highly reflective. 
Okay, Vesta is um, the fourth one discovered uh, by Olbers, as I mentioned before. And this one's a very interesting one. We're going to get to uh, Vesta in close up here in just a little bit. But I should say Vesta is um, where Vestal comes from. And of course, our observatory is in Vestal, so Vestal means it's from Vesta. Vesta apparently was the Roman goddess of um, home and hearth, and, uh, and her offspring were Vestal, Vestalites or whatever, but they're actually called Vestal. So pretty big, too. All right, and this was the best images we had of Vesta before the uh, Dawn spacecraft arrived there. Um, you can see a little blurry, but there, there are definitely some some bright areas and dark areas. Actually, it turns out it's very similar to our moon, uh, what they call the basalt areas, being the dark areas. And there's some bright, bright stuff too, which we'll get to see closer up. So just a few more of ones of interest here. Uh, this one's iris, and this one actually has a surface that's rich with iron and magnesium. And again, you can see where, where it lies, still right, right there at fairly circular in that asteroid belt. And then the, this is the uh, fourth largest one, it's uh, Hygieia, discovered in 1849 by Anabali de Gasparis, who actually discovered a lot of them. Um, and, and this is a big one, and again, the C-type. And this one is actually being considered to be a dwarf planet. So the conditions are such, it's spherical. The, the fancy word they use for spherical is uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. So it's pretty much mass is enough that it, it, it actually has kind of shaped itself into almost a sphere. So this one is going to be getting more attention. You can see the facts on it again, very, again, similar to the, to the other ones. So this one was another one that's just kind of interesting, the fifth largest member, um, Interomnia. And this one was discovered a little bit more recently, in 1910. And this one is just close to being spherical. Um, tipped a little bit more than some of the other ones. And this, this one fascinated me. Uh, it turned out that when the Galileo mission went to Jupiter, it um, actually passed by this asteroid in the asteroid belt called Ida. And Ida is unique because it has a moon. And it's called Dactyl. It's the name of the moon. So, and we suspect there'll be other ones out there that also have moons. Kind of looks like a yam, right? So, anyway, so, um, in I think 2015, the Dawn mission arrived at at um, two of the, at, the asteroids, Ceres and Vesta. It actually arrived at Vesta first, and it, it was absolutely fascinating. So let's see here. You can see it's kind of itinerary. It took off like in 07, and it arrived in uh, Vesta in actually, I guess it was actually 11. 2011, then it got to series in 2015. And again, here's a picture of it, and you can see it's, you know, pretty big across. Um, also, interesting one thing about some of these asteroids like Vesta and Ceres, they're actually not that co as cold as you think. The average temperature of uh, Vesta in the daytime is actually minus 60 degrees Celsius, which sounds cold, but um, some areas are actually minus 30, so I guess with the right kind of clothing, we could survive that. <laughs> but here's some close-ups of the surface. And Vesta, you know, people consider it like a, a protoplanet almost, so it's got that metallic core, it's got a mantle and a crust, very much like uh, the planets, right? But it just it didn't have a chance to form. So, so they're thinking about call, actually calling it a protoplanet. And we're going to take a little journey now. We're going to do a, uh, this is a, um, a kind of a simulated flyover of, of um, Vesta. So give me one moment.
this guy. So the next stop was Ceres. And Ceres is, um, is the biggest one, like I said. And it turned out that they've discovered that there's water below the surface. And like there may be more water on Ceres than there, on, than there is on Earth. So when we think about maybe life in some of these other places, like certainly we're exploring the moons of Jupiter and Saturn for that. But Ceres is a little closer to home. And um, certainly there's going to be more interest and more, um, maybe more things planned to visit, to visit Ceres. Uh, we'll get to that white spot in a moment. <laughs> Oops, sir. So here's a view of the surface. And you see, you know, you see a lot of smoother areas, which, which means it's a, a newer surface, a younger surface, which usually indicates something might be happening, you know, below a geologically active world. And it actually does have a thin water vapor atmosphere. So, and again, not, not as cold as you'd maybe expect it to be. They say that uh, there is actually... A, like kind of gas ex escaping from Ceres that actually loses its mass uh, every every year or so. So this is that bright spot. So it, you know, there's some early thoughts it could just be magnesium and so forth, but actually it's, it turns out it's sodium carbonate, which is your ingredient for a laundry detergent. So I guess if we ever set up a space station here, we'll be able to you know, supply our own, um, own laundry detergent. And there's a very unusual mountain, but very, a very alien world. But again, there's a, a lot of things that we have to consider. Maybe, maybe prioritizing Ceres as a place to go back. And you can see the layers of Ceres. Very much like the um, world, some of the worlds around Jupiter and Saturn. And even though we see Ceres is big, it's actually, <laughs> you know, pretty pretty small in comparison even to our own moon. But our moon is sort of a, 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 an, abnormal, an abnormality. Our moon is actually one of the seven giant moons of the solar system. There, um, obviously, we have one, the moon. We also Jupiter has four. Ganymede being the largest moon in the solar system. Uh, Saturn has um, one of them being Titan, so also bigger than the planet Mercury. And then Neptune has Triton. And those seven moons are almost planet size, pretty much. So. so let's go ahead and take a fly over Ceres now.
um, we're going to kind of wrap up with the last uh, asteroid. And by the way, there's, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of them out there. But one thing that's kind of interesting, we, you know, my, my first thought of the asteroid belt was just like a swarm of rocks. And it was like, you know, it was like a video game. You had to avoid them. But it turns out it's mostly vacant. There's just millions of miles between these asteroids on average. So. But this one here, six, when, by the way, the number means what the, in the order of discovery. You probably figured that out already. But the 16th one discovered was one called Psyche, which is actually in the news now, which we'll get to momentarily. It's an M-type asteroid. In fact, it's all nickel and iron and probably other metals. So, um, and it's like pretty much right where the other ones are, discovered by um, Anibale de Gasparis in 1852. And I'll bet you he had no idea what a big deal this was going to be because now there's a mission planned to, to reach Psyche. It was actually supposed to launch this last month, but due to a software error, they, have, they had to put it off until next October which unfortunately makes it a six-year journey instead of a four-year journey and also cost 117 million dollars so extra <laughs> so <laughs> but anyway uh here you see what the spacecraft will look like and, and an artist's impression of what um what psyche might look like and i should say especially when you study the outer solar system or worlds that have not been visited yet by spacecraft we, that's where the artists come in. They, they use the scientific data that we have, and they kind of create their own impression of what these worlds look like, which makes it a lot of, a lot of fun. So, so there's a number of goals uh, that they have, of course, and, and some objectives. But I should say um, they're estimating the value of this, of this um asteroid to be in the quintillions and I didn't even know that was a real number so quintillion means a billion a billion so there's the value of this is going to be um, is astronomical no pun intended and of course you wonder well will they mine this place so maybe maybe that's something that might happen in the future who will be the first place who will be the first country to get there right but anyway um, so you can see what the goals are here and um, and we're going to hopefully get to learn a lot more about this, but you're going to have to wait till 2029. So that's when it's going to arrive. Oops, there's some of the equipment here. And the, 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 spectro the spectrometers are very important. In fact, um, that's how we know like some of the asteroid or meteorites that have landed on the Earth, like meteors that have hit the Earth, are actually from members of the asteroid belt. Like um, 1960, they found one in Antarctica that was the same um, spect to spectromatic range as Vesta. And they're quite sure it came from Vesta. So, so here's the, the big plan. And if all goes well, it will launch next October and get there in August of 2029. So um, keep your fingers crossed. So now, if it, after it takes off, we'll certainly have a, an event here of some sort. And you know, we'll be following it, of course, um, throughout its mission. So it'll actually fly by Mars. So that'll be, I'm sure, fun to see as well. So I think that's pretty much the tour of our asteroid bell here. Uh, we'll kind of open it up to questions that we'll see if we can answer them. So, anybody have any questions or thoughts? Okay. Um, the mounting on Ceres, do you have an idea of how it might have worked? Repeat the question. Yes. So, the mountains on Ceres, uh, how did it form? Well, there's water ice underneath, and there's forces at work, much like here on, on Earth. So, and would you guys you'd have um, just um, ge a geologically active world? And just put them out, probably formed out of just things squeezing each other and sliding under things and so forth. But the great question. We'll have to look more into that. I've got a question down here. Um, is the asteroid belt in the future going to form a planet or will it never? And if not, why hasn't it formed a planet yet? That is a great question. I probably should have addressed some of that. So why basically... Why is there no planet in the asteroid belt currently? And actually, one theory is that there was at one time, and it was in the collision 
you know, and just and another piece just kind of kept smashing into each other. Another theory is that Jupiter's immense gravity just wouldn't allow the planet to a planet to form. Also, uh, I should point out too that Jupiter's gravity still has an effect on some of these asteroids out there. If they're clo relatively close to Mars, even, but if they're lined up with Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity will send some of these small ones out of orbit and elsewhere in the solar system. So we're always keeping an eye out for that. So as we, we try to see, figure out ways if we can protect the Earth, you know, from asteroids and so forth. I have another question here uh, in front. Um, do you think that maybe Jupiter, like, stole some of the asteroids for, like, some of its moons? Maybe if they used to be in the asteroid belt? That's a, a, certainly a, a good possibility. Um, and also the other way around, that some of those uh, larger asteroids, like Hygieia and, and maybe Ceres and so forth, might have actually been moons that, you know, basically got, got pulled away. So it's so just a thought. So it could go either way, but that's a, that's a very good possibility so any other questions oh, we got a couple, couple more questions here in the uh, in the audience here let's uh, take this over hi I know we said that the craters could reach up to I think 36 miles long how deep can they go hmm. good question I, I don't know the answer to that but um, maybe someone else can we can maybe look that up here before before you leave so but I mean c certain bodies are more um, you know, have more, I don't use polarity, but more, um, you know, have smoother surfaces than others. And it has to do with it's more geologically active, like a newer surface, that is, then a lot of those holes get filled in, you know, and so forth. But, or also, there's some, there's, I know there's a, um, for example, there's a moon, a Saturn called Mimas, and it's got like an 88 mile wide crater, you know, miles deep. So that was from an impact. So, yeah. All right, another question over here. Yeah, I just wanted to know, did that, was that white spot on Ceres actually emitting light? No, but it's highly, that's a quick question, is that uh, does the uh, white spot on Ceres emit light? And actually it's just, uh, it's just highly reflective. And that's, um, you know, that's, that's how it stu stood out so much. They, they, they were very curious as they approached, they noticed that. Like, what is that, you know? So, um, so it's just highly reflective. Some of the... Uh, that also helps us figure out there's ice on some of these worlds, like Enceladus, which is a, a very important moon of uh, Saturn. It's, what, it's the most reflective object in the solar system other than the sun, of course. And that's because it's covered with ice, snow and ice, actually. So it's, it's therefore, its uh, magnitude or brightness is, is a lot, you know, a lot more, you know, um, uh, greater, so, yeah. All right, I know we've got at least uh, one question from the uh, chat, so here we're gonna hand this over to Jeremy. Uh, a batch of questions. Uh, so the first one uh, comes from Gemma. And they ask, who's naming the asteroids? So the, <laughs> there's a, uh, a, a, a Congress, and even it's been around for hundreds of years. And um, um, they basically, for example, the planet Uranus, uh, it got its name and they were originally going to name, name it Georgia. That from the, uh, William Herschel discovered it, but they said, uh-uh. So we got to give it a Greek Roman name, uh, like all the other planets had. And what they did, they figured, okay, well, um, since Saturn is the father of, of Uranus, of uh, Jupiter rather, then Uranus turns out in mythology is the father of Saturn. So that's where they came up with that one. But all of these ones have the pick names that are basically mythological. And um, as far as the asteroid belt ones here, they're mostly like Greek and Roman. Um, the um, Every now and then they'll, they'll, they'll like pick a different mythology, like for some of the other moons of, of so forth, other planets, and 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 so what. But, uh, but yeah, there is a governing Congress that decides that. In fact, uh, just to give another good example, the dwarf planet Eris, which was discovered in the early 2000s. Well, it was discovered by Mike Brown, and he wanted to name it um, Xena, you know, for his favorite TV show. <laughs> and he figured since he found it, it was his right. But they go, uh-uh. And they made it, they changed it to Eris, which is a, which is a basically I think the um, Greek god of like causing trouble, which of course it did for Pluto. So that's where they, so sometimes there's a hidden meaning behind these. But um, I hope I answered your question. So, any other? Um, some more in the chat here. Sure. Oh sure. Uh, so, 
couple people are generally curious about the origins of the asteroid belt. So where did it come from? Well, when the solar system was created, um, you know, there was enough material there to possibly form a planet. But like, kind of like we mentioned before, either Jupiter's gravity prevented that or some other chaotic collision prevented it. And um, when we get to think about Psyche, which, for example, was all metal, that could be what they call um, a um, planetoid, whatever. It was the beginning of a planet. It had that core. And that's all, that's all just a, fra a fragment that remains. But yeah, so definitely it's, it's, it's from material when the solar system was formed. Yep. And uh, from only in Antarctica, uh, regular here on the Copernic Channel, <laughs> uh, what is the difference between an asteroid and a comet? Well, well from what we know, comets emit, um, you know, obviously have a tail. They have a, the, uh, we see the, the dust tail that comes out. Um, they're, the, they're saying that the definitions between them are kind of getting more and more blurred as we uh, discover some of these other, other objects out there. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else have any thoughts on that? But I mean, com comets typically have these really wild orbits. They're really super, super um, eccentric and ellipt, and they, they're really tipped to the plane. And they can take hundreds of thousands of years, maybe longer, to make one trip around the sun. These guys, of course, are all, you know, going around the sun, um, you know, between the time it would take Mars and Jupiter, which was about, um, you know, four and five years. So, uh, we got one in the oh, another one in, in here in the audience. Here we go. Does the white spot on Ceres emit radiation? Not that we know, so, but we'll certainly get a closer look at it when we send our next mission out there. So, well, Other than light radiation. Yeah. It's radiating light. Any other questions here? Uh, oh, another one back here in the, in the back. Thank you. So when you were talking about one of the protoplanets, you seemed like you knew that they were at a, uh, a core of, like, nickel and iron. Yeah. How could that possibly be known? I was just wondering, like, you seemed confident. Um. Well, so so they, they spec, what they call it spectrometry, and the the light we receive from that it basically reveals the clues, like it it reveals the chemistry in each of the different objects, and um, in the lattices from obviously light, you know, um, and so forth. And obviously, some of these we've actually come up, you know, close to. So, um, yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Well, actually, as it turns out, in our uh, physics classroom, we actually have a periodic table, but it's not the one you're sort of used to seeing. It's actually spectra of every element. And so what Robert is saying is that, you know, as light is reflected off of there, certain wavelengths tend to present, you know, more, more strongly than others. And that uh, is, is part of, of how they're ultimately determining, ah, that has a particular element uh, on board. But trying to sort of sort through all of those, I mean, it's not like it's just one big, you know, uh, yeah. plutonium, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, asteroid. So they're having to sort of sort through all, of the, uh, all, all that information, but ultimately that's how they, how they get that information. Right. And actually we do that here sometimes. If we have some fun. We have a, our spectrum tubes, our gas spectrum tubes out here. We turn the lights off and we give you guys like these special glasses to, to look through and you will actually try to identify the, what we call the fingerprint of which gas it is. You know, we only have a handful, but um, it's fun. You really have to focus very, very closely to see how much green are you seeing, how much red are you seeing, you know, how much uh, blue or purple, whatever. So it's, uh, it's, it's a fun activity. So you know, definitely you know, something to check out when we, we're here. So. All right, another question on the other side. We'll pan over here. And so you talked about how far these asteroids are from the sun. Um, and we talk about it as the asteroid belt. But how distributed are the asteroids through that belt? Are they evenly distributed? in their orbit, or is there a concentration in one area or another? 
Well, the, the, that's a great question, is, is the, the concentration of, of the different asteroids in the asteroid belt, the different members here. And I guess the ones that are the, the S ones, the silicate ones, are closer. They seem to be more closer to Earth or closer to the sun, whatever. They're the ones that um, are the stony ones. And in fact, Vesta was actually is closer to us than Ceres is. So um, it seems like some of the different types of asteroids are clo closer or farther away from us, depending on which one, one it is. Uh, but also, there is like, like I said, there could be millions of miles between any given given asteroid, but they do seem to be clustered a little bit as far as what type they are. So if we're sending uh, a mission out, yeah, beyond, beyond Mars, um, are they trying specifically to avoid the asteroid, asteroid bit, or, or they figure the chances of getting hit by an asteroid are pretty small, so we're just going to plow straight through it? Uh, yeah, I guess they just plow straight through it. <laughs> but I think they, they kind of know where, you know, obviously our telescopes are so powerful, we kind of know where, where they are. And maybe they take that in consideration when they, you know, do a flight plan. But the one, like, I think, remember that one picture we saw back there was uh, when the uh, Galileo spacecraft was on its way to Jupiter. It, it flew right by that one, Ida, which mm -hmm. is when it had the moon. So, and chances are we never would have known it had a moon unless that spacecraft flew, flew by it. So, um, yeah. Uh, any other questions here? Oh, another one. All right, let me just do a little pan. So, who decides what is an asteroid? What's a dwarf planet, and what's an actual planet? Like, who makes that decision, and what is it based on? <laughs> so, uh, who decides what's an asteroid or a dwarf planet or or a regular planet? And that is such a great question. It all stems back to a meeting. I want to say it was back in two thousand six or two thousand eight, and uh, there was a big convention. They were going to decide what to classify Pluto as because they had already discovered Eris and Sedna and all these other so-called, soon to be called dwarf planets. And actually, it turned out that two-thirds of the people already left the convention. <laughs> so already you have controversy. So they, when they voted on it, they voted that Pluto was no longer a planet. And they came up with the term dwarf planet. And some of the new ones out there with Pluto are also you know, called dwarf planets as well. And then they decided that well, Ceres fit the criterion to be a dwarf planet. And what that is, is first of all, I guess to be a planet, you have to be, uh, first of all, have your, that hydrostatic equilibrium where, where you're big enough to create your spherical shape, okay? Um, also, you have to uh, be able to clear your area of, of other objects. So you're, you've got everything, things are in order. And the other thing, too, is you have to solely go around the sun, okay, not around another object. And that's where things get interesting with Pluto. Pluto actually, um, you know, it's certainly spherical, and it's, it has five moons that harmoniously go around the planet. It's amazing. But for every two times Pluto goes around the sun, Neptune goes around three times. So Neptune has a lot of control in Pluto's movement around the sun. So that was what kind of knocked Pluto out. And um, Ceres, I guess, uh, meets those categories in the sense that it's, it's certainly spherical. It's big enough. It goes around the sun by itself, whatever. But there's a lot of stuff around it. So it hasn't exactly cleared its neighborhood of, of debris or whatever you want to call it, space stuff. <laughs> so that's what decides what a planet is. And um, so dwarf planets are those that you know, pretty much um, are very close, to, but they don't meet all three of those criteria. And the rest of the stuff could be just an asteroid or you know, comet or whatever. So, I, I, I have a theory that if we called Pluto anything else, nobody would care. If we called it Aldon, no, no problem. We're calling it a dwarf planet, but calling it the same name as that cute Disney character, all of a sudden people are up in arms about that. So uh, <laughs> it just depends on what you call it, I guess. Um, I think we got another uh, question from the, uh, from the chat. All right, last question in the chat. Uh, so how long would it take to reach the asteroids in the asteroid belt? So um, if, you, you know, if, if um, I think if you're making a straight shot, it would only take maybe a couple of years. But because it's going to be the orbit things, they have to get a very special path. And sometimes you have to use other planets to get gravity assist to continue. In the case of the upcoming Psyche mission, it's going to be going around Mars, slingshotting around Mars, that is. So it's going to take six years. Now, had it left this year, it would have only taken four because the planets, meaning Earth, 
um, Earth um, and the, I'm sorry, Earth and, and Psyche and Mars were all kind of in a, a, prop, a the optimal line. So it would have been a shorter distance and it would have been less complicated to get there. So, uh, so, so I guess the answer is it depends, but I think if you just went straight out, you could get there, you know, just if you just wanted to cruise by the asteroid belt, you could get there in a couple of years. So but getting back to the, la the previous question too, I think it's important to say that, you know, I know these guys kind of, the scientists or whatever, they kind of discuss whether things are, you know, debate whether they should be a planet or whatever. But I've always found the fun thing is that we just keep finding new things and they're exciting things and that's the fun of it, so. All right, wait, another question here in the, uh, here on site, let me just flip over here. So in terms of some of that research you showed, like with the seven to 15 year project, what kind of um, determines whether research is pursued after like those research objectives are kind of sought after and what kind of makes the decisions? So, so you're saying like once we visit something, do we go back, is that what you mean or? Yeah, research is pursued in terms of such a big project, how long do they usually continue like, research on these certain planets or asteroids? Well, that, that's a really good question. So how long can some of these missions be extended and why did maybe we go there or go there again? That's, that's great. Mars is a great example for that. Uh, the very first two Mars rovers, actually not counting Pathfinder, but the uh, ones after that were Spirit and Opportunity and they lasted like over 10 years. It was amazing. They were only supposed to last for 90 days. But they kept working, and we were just fascinated by all the, the data, the images that we were getting. So, yeah, it was all systems go, keeping it, keeping it going. Um, and, and people that can make a, a compelling argument for funding. That's yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and also the Jupiter and Saturn, I think the, the, perhaps the main reasons why we, we go there, to, to go, we're going to go there again in the Saturn's case, is really to... Um, to see these moons that are over the planets because there's the, perhaps the best chance for life actually exists on some of those moons around Saturn and Jupiter. Saturn and Enceladus, but even Titan. Uh, and then in, in Jupiter, of course, you've got Europa, which is the, the main target. And there's a mission there right now, basically, orbiting Jupiter. So, yeah. So let's see. And, and I guess, yeah, if, there's, if, there, if the things are still working, the equipment's still working, and still putting out lots of... Uh, valuable information then they, they keep it so. all right get another Thanks. question over here and over here a little bit i was just wondering how many asteroids have been discovered so far and if that number is going up at all hmm. well the number okay how, how many have they discovered um in the asteroid belt or just everywhere the asteroid, belt. asteroid belt yeah i mean they, i think they keep finding on new ones, but now the, the now their argument is, and it's the same argument for whether it's a moon around a planet. If, if it's the size of a suitcase, should it count as a member of the asteroid belt, or you know, likewise. So, so the, I think there's gonna have, they're going to determine what the size cutoff is. But I think there's like tens of thousands at least. But um, I did actually um, I printed off a little uh, a paper here that has um, the like said the largest ones here. Thanks. Largest ones, um, and um, it's got well, it's got a little picture of the asteroid belt back there, but it's got the largest ones. And uh, your only homework assignment is that uh, to add the letter A for the word steroids, because it's uh, it's asteroids. <laughs> Somehow it didn't come through, so that's your only homework assignment. But you've been great sports, so we also have the remaining dawn. It's the mission that went to series and invested dawn bookmarkers and stickers. So you're free to, to take those with you. And um, yeah, and I guess do we have any more questions? Or? All right, anything else in the chat? All right, well, Robert, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, your time and the research that you put into this. Uh, you always uh, keep us glued to our seats and uh, had some great, uh, great questions from, from uh, both the people here as well as those on... Uh, on the chat. Um, we, so we have a rule here that you can't leave Copernic until you look through a telescope and uh, unfortunately tonight's not going to be one of those nights. So if you paid to get in, um, uh, see uh, uh, one of our interns uh, at the cash register and they'll give you a card to come back uh, for free. But 
uh, especially for anybody who's maybe never been here before, I'd be happy to give you a tour uh, of the facility and take you out to the scopes and uh, and show you uh, show you what we have to offer. So uh, anyway, um, so I want to thank you all for again coming up tonight. Uh, again, next week, Mark Pellerito from the National Weather Service will be here to talk about the the, the huge snowstorm. Oop. The huge snowstorm that we had back in uh, 2020, and also talking about what uh, uh, what we can expect uh, this coming um, this coming winter, and uh, uh, exactly how much rock salt do we need to be uh, buying for the, for the sidewalk. So, thanks again. Uh, thanks again for watching on the um, on the live stream, and uh, see you soon. <laughs>